So I'm, I'm here today to talk about pricing. So um, I was listening to a really interesting book um, called Black Box Thinking. I don't know if anybody's come across that by a guy called Matthew Saeed. Um, and one of the examples which he used in Black Box Thinking was about um, David Beckham. And they interviewed David Beckham, they interviewed David Beckham's mum. And David's, uh, David's mum's sort of recollection is from the age of six, he was going out into the garden every day after school and doing keepy-uppies. And he set himself a target to beat his keepy-uppy you know, thing every single day, uh, his tally. When he was nine, he did 2,003 keepy-uppies wow. in a row. Ball didn't touch the ground. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He got bored of that, unsurprisingly, and turned, turned his attention to taking free kicks. Now, we've all seen David Beckham's free kicks into the top corner, and there was the, the, the one in, was it 2012 at the World Cup, where, where we beat Greece. Does, anybody, does everybody kind of remember that? Okay. So, and his mum said that, his mum and his coach and his dad said that potentially, they, they obviously they didn't count them, but he did somewhere in the region of 50,000 free kicks in order to perfect that. And actually, out of the 400 or so professional goals that David Beckham has scored, 76 of them were from that um, from the free kick. Okay, which is pretty damn impressive, isn't it? Okay, but you see the amount of times that he had to fail in order to to do that. And his, one of his mum's comments was that you know she watched the frustration in him. We all shared in like the joy when he scored those goals. But his mum was sat there every time the ball touched the ground, and he had to start again. You could sense the frustration. Now, what's, how this is relevant to pricing is, how often do any of you update your prices? Yeah? Once a year, probably, I'm guessing. How many of you are like once a year, twice a year max? Some of you probably haven't updated them in several years. Who's in that camp? Okay. Now, pricing is like any behavior or function in business. It requires practice. You have to fail. You have to try different price points in order to get and create a business which is sustainable, which um, satisfies your lifestyle or your partner's lifestyle. Depends on which way you look at it. Okay. So I'm going to be talking a bit about pricing and how we start to overcome some of these, you know, because most people just don't want to change their pricing because it's fear actually which stops us from taking action. So I'm going to dig into that. I want you to do something for me first and foremost, though. I want you to, on a scale of one to ten, just write this number down on a bit of paper somewhere. On a scale of 1 to 10, right? if I asked you right now to double your prices, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you that you would do it? Okay? Right? Because, because at the end of this talk... Now, some of you are going to listen to this talk, and you're going to do nothing with it. And that's a shame. It's a real shame. Because I've worked with hundreds of business owners... And pricing is one of the things that, that one of the three things basically that business owners get stuck on the most. Okay, I've worked with enough business owners to know now that fundamentally every single person in this room, well, probably most of my clients have already done this, but every single person in this room can double their prices with very little change in terms of uh, negative change. They would sell the same number of clients as they're currently getting, but fundamentally they end up with double the revenue. Okay, so. Like I said, pricing is one of the things which I work on through Fearless Business. So this is now just giving you a quick intro into the, um, uh, the coaching program that potentially you're going to be bidding on a bit later on. So we focus on product architecture, um, make sure that we're designing products which satisfy at least 80 or 90% of the marketplace. The other 10 to 20% are a pain in the ass. They're tie kickers and time wasters. So we work out a way to filter them out. Pricing is mostly about mindset, so I'm going to be digging into that a lot in the next sort of 20 minutes or so. And then finally, we also then look at lead flow, um, which is not about marketing. It's the process of reducing, because your product's better now. Your pricing has increased. So you've got to get better at being able to tell people about the value proposition which you offer and be able to sell it. Okay, so that's the third and final part which we work through on Fearless Business. Fearless Business is a 12-week um, a group accelerator program. Uh, there's a very extensive online portal and workbook which you get with it. I'm selling my program now, by the way, just in case you haven't noticed. I want you to bid on this thing. This is a lot of money, potentially several hundred pounds, which could be going to all sorts. This is really, really important. So it's a 12-week group accelerator. It's non portal. There's a really extensive workbook. Uh, it's group accountability, weekly calls. Some of my clients are in the room as well, so go and have a chat with them and talk about their experiences on fearless business. Um, I have one single objective, and that is to help my clients to double their turnover and or profit because you can still have the same turnover, but get more profit. Um, and like I said, the value of that is £2,500, including VAT. 
Okay, this is just to put it into perspective. When you put your bid in, yeah, when you when you all put your bids in, for me, <laughs> hey Adam, um, that's that's kind of just to base your value on it. Okay, so to give you a bit of a, enough of the sales pitch, right? So we're going to dig in now to a bit of theory, and I want you to start making some notes now. Okay, so there are three ways to grow a business. <laughs> Any guesses what those three ways to grow a business are? <laughs> yeah. Sell more. Yeah. What's the third one? Better clients. Are there any accountants in the room? Yeah, so first one is reduced cost, basically. In, in my opinion, like it pleases the accountants, but it's a bit boring. It doesn't create like it doesn't really accelerate your growth, okay, as much as the other two do. So uh, this is the only slide I've got on cutting costs. Sorry, I'm not gonna educate you on that. The second one is to sell more of the same thing. So I've noticed that most business owners come to my program, they um, are just solely focused on marketing, you need to get more clients. Okay, but imagine this scenario, right? We've got a little Fiat 500, okay, with this little 500cc engine, and we add some rocket fuel into it. It's going to go really fast for a really short period of time and then explode. Yeah, it's not terribly efficient. And fundamentally, what I see is a lot of business owners they come into um, the the product and pricing is a bit like the engine of that car, and the rocket fuel is marketing. So if you add more marketing to a, an engine which is fundamentally already broken or not doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't serve you. The problems and you know it's just going to explode quicker. Okay, does that make sense? So we don't want to be adding more. What we want to do is we want to go back and just check that our offer is right, our product's right, you know, and our pricing's right, and then we want to wind up the flywheel, spin up the flywheel in terms of from a marketing perspective. Um, and also what what it creates is because because we end up in this, and I'm going to talk about it and say the sales cycle of doom, I call it, sell, deliver, sell, deliver, get more clients, get more clients, get more clients, um, we start to become a little bit desperate in our marketing, okay? We end up sp spraying like marketing shit all over our clients. And some of you who came last year will have seen my, um, uh, the magical marketing mystery machine talk, which I did, okay? This is just a little recap. And even then, like, we still don't start to question why marketing isn't working for our business, okay? So I'm going to just get you to do another little test, okay? So some of you will have seen me do this before, but I want you to um, just get out your phones for me. Step number one, okay? Step number two, go to Amazon. Step number three, Type in Robin Waite. <laughs> Step number four, buy one of my books. <laughs> Interestingly, do you, do you hear some of those comments already? So there's already a bit of like, it's what I call tension in the marketplace. Because people, there's a bit of, oh, oh, do I trust him? Always oh, trying to be a bit clever, okay? I'm not trying to be clever, I'm trying to prove a point. Two slightly different things here, okay? Um, stand up once you've done that. I'm being serious now. Go and buy a book and stand up. I've already bought all your yeah, yeah, books. <laughs> well, that's why I said if you have, if you've done this already, yeah. So if you haven't done this exercise, just stand up. They're on discount. One of them's on discount at the moment. Fine, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take, Take your shots on. So can you can you please, somebody stand up, please? <laughs> if you bought if you bought the book, stand up. Yeah. Now, isn't it amazing? Okay, you can sit, you can sit down now because I think the point's made. So, a third of the room stood up then, right? I've given you four very simple steps to do. Perfect customer journey, right? The, I'm, I'm here in a position of trust having put this event on for three years. I've got a number of my clients in the room, okay? Some of you even still are like, oh, that's a bit clever. I wouldn't buy it. Ooh, do I trust him, right? But, but I've given you four. The, the multi billion dollars that Amazon invested in that platform. And yet two thirds of the room still couldn't buy a book or didn't buy a book. Isn't that amazing? Okay, that's the perfect customer journey right there, and yet people still can't buy. So is marketing the solution? No, it's not. Okay, but we can start with pricing. So one of the things that I talked about the sales cycle of doom. Okay, and um, if you um, if you know about anything to do with um, sort of uh, 
astronauts and things like that in the International Space Station, they did a study, scientists did a study of astronauts when they've been up to the International Space Station and come back down, so they've been up there for nine months, come back down, they're actually eight minutes younger than they would have been had they been on the Earth. Oh, Isn't that cool? So, um, and actually, um, you know, the sales cycle of doom is very similar where you're, and basically it's down to, I won't go through Einstein's theories of relativity and all sorts of fun stuff like that, but, um, but essentially it's down to gravity, the gravitational field. And what happens is when we get into this marketing, the sales cycle of doom, sell, deliver, sell, deliver, sell, deliver, we're creating like gravity around us, which we can't get out of, okay? And it feels very constrictive, okay? Remember what I said about rocket fuel? We've somehow got to create momentum to break out of that. Okay, and this is where pricing kind of kicks into it. If we increase our prices, we create a bit of bandwidth for ourselves. Okay, so we sell something for double or treble the price. Now, I'm not suggesting you just double or treble your prices. There's more, a little bit more to it than that, okay? But for sake of argument, if we double or treble our prices, we get a little bit more time to deliver a better quality product, and off the back end of it, we get paid a bit more money, okay? And the gravity field kind of just slowly starts to expand and life becomes much easier. Does this, does this kind of make some kind of sense? Okay. So pricing, you know, increasing your prices is one of the quickest wins that you can get in your business if you do it right. And basically one of the reasons why we don't put our prices up is because we're just too afraid. We're afraid that our existing clients will leave us. We're afraid that it will um, uh, detract or repel potential new prospects. Um, and the fear kind of kicks in and we kind of talk ourselves out of it, okay? And there's actually three stages that we go through when, or I take my clients through when we're talking about increasing our prices. But first, it's um, really important to understand what the most common mistakes are. And again, I'm going to see a lot of people nodding when I start to go through these, okay? Um, the first common pricing mistake which I see is people charging time for money. So if you're selling a day rate, an hourly rate, or something along those lines, the reason why that's a mistake is because um, it's actually, I know most of us are fairly upstanding, like we have high moral, high moral code, good, good ethical standards. But fundamentally, when you're selling a day rate, it's kind of, if I was selling a day rate, it'd be in, within my interest to allow that just to eke out and for the job to take a little bit longer so I get paid more money, potentially. Okay? I wouldn't do that. I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't do that. But fundamentally, it's within my best interest, not the client's. Okay? The way around that is to start talking about results and outcomes. Package things up so you're a bit more clever about it. And one of the reasons why a lot of business owners fail to step out of hourly rate or day rate is because they're just not very confident in their ability to deliver a result. Now, we can't get a, a clearly defined outcome each and every time. But at least if we set out with that relationship with the best possible intentions of creating that result for the client, it's more likely to happen. Again, is this, is this making, mistake, making sense? Is anybody kind of in that camp of making mistake number one? Like, and there's no harm in just, yeah, there's no harm in kind of owning up to it. Okay, part of this is a bit of a reality check. Mistake number two is charging what everybody else charges. Okay, it might be that 95% of the similar businesses in your area, in your niche, are all charging the same amount of money. Because what happened when you started your business up, I'll go and do a bit of competitive research, I'll go and see what the competition are doing. Oh, they're all charging X number of pounds per hour, I should probably do the same. Fundamentally, they might all be wrong. Okay? Now, most of us are running small, you know, agile small businesses. The reality is we probably only need 10 to 20, you know, you know a small number of very loyal customers in order to create a really nice, sustainable small business and a healthy income for ourselves. We don't need all of the clients. So why do we compete on price? Actually, nobody really benefits from that. Okay? We just end up in sell, deliver, sell, deliver, sell, deliver. We get worn out. I see so many business owners just getting burnt out because they're just in this sales cycle of doom, like market, sell, deliver, market, sell, deliver. Okay? It doesn't serve anybody. Um, so there's capacity out there if we can find 10 or 20 people who un understand our value. To, to buy into what we're doing at a higher price. Yeah? Is anybody like, no, this is bullshit, Rob. I don't, that doesn't make any sense. You're all getting this. Everybody's looking at me like. <laughs> cool. Just a, a, an example of that. So when I first set out in my marketing business to, in 2004, we were charging £10 a month for support and hosting. It wasn't very, well, it was a lot then. Uh, it's not a lot by today's standards. And um, as the recession was kind of kicking in, I, I'm, an, I'm not an ec economist, so, but I had a feeling that something was a bit awry when everybody started like 
scrapping for all the cheapest hosting solutions out there. Like it was a bum fight to, to get the cheapest possible solution. And um, I was like, that's, I don't really see how that's going to serve anybody. I think there's a potential opportunity here. So I said to my business partner then, let's put the prices up. And he said, what, 10 or 20%? And I said, no, no, a, a lot more than that. Let's 5x it. <gasps> oh, no, we couldn't possibly do that. All of our customers will leave. Uh, you know, the, the panic set in, the fear set in. Uh, I won. So we did it anyway. Um, yes, a lot of our clients left. So we had 120 clients at the time. 40 of them left. Okay. Uh, but our revenue went up two and a half times, and that saw us nicely through the recession as a small business. That was a shrewd move. Um, there were 30 design and marketing agencies in Stroud at the time when we made that decision. By the end of the recession, I call that about 2012, there was only five good ones, and we were one of them. Okay? So pricing fundamentally made one of that, that one decision saw us through a really tough time in business. Okay? Those sort of 40 or so clients, what do you think they were? Pain in the ass. I'm not going to lie. They, our, our support calls dropped by 80%. Okay? So we lost all of our clients who were taking up most of our time. Okay? And that actually gave us the opportunity to deliver a better quality product. We had more bandwidth to then more income to be able to bring in a team to support fewer clients, which kind of sounds contradictory, but um, that then gave me and my business partner time to be more creative about what other things could we then start offering our clients. So remember what I talked about, that, that um, the universe expanding when we increase our pricing? Time, like, it's so invaluable. Uh, another example, so some of you will know Richard and Amy. They run a web design company down in Clevedon. One of my first coaching clients, when I met them, they were charged, uh, earning about £800 a month, husband and wife partnership. Um, I got a message from them about two months ago, and we, we stopped working at the end of um, 2018. Got a message from them two months ago saying they'd just turned over 6 and k and they were doing it regularly. Isn't that cool? Half that revenue was sustainable revenue from hosting packages. So they were making three, three and a bit times their revenue in support and hosting alone when they were you know, making 800 pounds a month through websites and things like that. We, we just tweaked a couple of things. We, they were vastly underpricing their websites, so we trebled the price of their websites, added more value, but we trebled the price of the websites. Like I used the same pricing strategy for the support and hosting. My, as I did for my business with them, and that fundamentally again is what's helped them. That, that you know they've got married now, they've um, they've just bought a new house. So, you know there's lots of exciting stuff happening as a result of it. So their universe has expanded. Price mistake number three: discounting core products. What I mean is discounting core products to get the first client in through the door. Okay, I actually believe that what you should do is um, if you're going to offer a discount, is um, offer a discount based on volume. So if somebody's willing to show that they're they trust you enough, they're going to put their, their faith in you. Let's reward that by giving them a bit of a, a discount for buying lots of your products or services. Make sense? So just to explain this, so what we used to do is um, sell branding workshops, one day branding workshops for £1,500. And the client would tick that, sign it, date it. This is in the sales meeting. And then what I used to do is just say, hey, look, 50% of our clients normally have day two and or day three. So if you tick one of those other boxes, I'm not £250 off. About four-fifths of the client would tick another box. The £250 extra we built into that price anyway. So it's a win-win. Okay, but we, we, were, we were just offering them the best possible solution. Next up, so there's going to be lots of threes here. So this one's fairly short. So three ways to price a product. Okay, the first one is based on commodity. Stack them high, sell them cheap. You know, typically this, you'll see this with e-commerce business, businesses, businesses who operate out in marketplaces like Shopify and Amazon and things like that. Okay, I don't think any, many, any of you in, are in that sort of marketplace, but sometimes you see service-based businesses slip into, slip into commodity-based pricing. The second way to price your products is through um, offering a value exchange. So this is when you're in that hourly rate, day rate. So, so I'm going to buy an hour of your time. Yeah, I'll accept £25 an hour. Cool, we're happy. Okay, I've given my reasons why I don't think that's the best possible solution. The third one, which is my favorite, is based on results and outcomes. Okay, so what I mean by that is that, um, you know, everybody's seen, uh, possibly seen this slide before, but this isn't about the drill, it's not about the hole, it's not about the rule plug that goes into the, the hole that, you, you know, you then attach the bracket to. Uh, it's not even about the painting that we put on there. It's actually about the story behind the painting. Okay? Now, the story behind the painting is that actually that was a, 
I don't know, something that me and my grandfather drew, and we used to do an art, you know, critique it, like art critiques, and that was just a happy memory, and now I've got that on the wall, okay? So when you're selling outcomes and results, you've got to really tap into the emotional, the value proposition, the story that sits behind the product or service that you're selling to your clients, okay? You've got to tap into, like, what's their biggest pain points? What's, what, is, what would be the ultimate solution for them? What would be the best possible result and outcome? And then price based on that. So some of you, um, again, will have seen this. So, you know, I met a, had a client who sold, um, well, about four years ago, they bought a shed business, buying and selling um, sort of little garden sheds, about 500 pounds each, 100 pound net profit on each one in a day to build. We started discussing garden studios. I've just built one for myself. Okay. They were um, about the same price as 30 sheds. They made about 50% more profit. But they take about, took about a third of the time to build as 30 sheds. So I said, why aren't you selling those? Okay, worth more, better product, better outcome. And they said, because we bought a shed business. <laughs> right, okay, that's not really a good valid reason, but okay. Uh, the second reason was because um, they were just like, oh, I don't know if anybody wants this. And I said, cool, tell me about like your setups. They had a, a forecourt with about 15 sheds on it, right? So uh, I said, cool, so people are coming here looking for sheds, they're getting sheds, they're walking away with a shed. Like, it's, it's plain and simple. How about we actually knock down three this weekend and we start building one of those? Within a month, they've taken deposits for two garden studios. They now sell them for 25K and about 8K profit, okay? So that pricing has given them bandwidth. They build one of those a month and their life is tickety-boo. They actually said when they came off my program, we're happy to have doubled our turnover because we're working a quarter of the time that we used to. We don't actually need to work with you anymore because we've achieved our goals. How cool is that? Okay. And okay, slightly different product, but you can see the impact that the pricing has had on, on, on their business. So I'm kind of coming up towards the end now. So I'm, I'm about to pull out a bit of a sucker punch, Adam. I'm sorry, but this is gonna, this is gonna win me. It's a sorry, not sorry. Yeah. Yeah. This is gonna win me the challenge. So, uh, for those of you who've done this exercise before, like keep keep stum, because this is for all of the noobs in the room. Okay, can I borrow a fiver? Take on tablets. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can, seriously, can I borrow a fiver? Cool. Cool. If if any of you like, you can all join in. If you've got a fiver on your table, just do this exercise. This is going to be a bit of fun, okay, for everybody to kind of join in. Yeah, I'm going to come over here. You, you, I'll tell you what, actually. I tell you, we haven't we haven't met before actually. So just hang on a second. I'll take your fiver. <laughs> there you go. Oh, You're welcome. That was easy. <laughs> no, in all seriousness. So what I want you to do, we're going to start. We're going to start. One of you starts, okay? And you're going to go around your table, and you're going to buy something off the person to your left or right. Doesn't matter. Just go around the table. You're going to buy something off the other person for a fiver. Okay, go. Until you get all the way back round to the start. Don't don't overthink it. Just do the exchange. Buy something all the way round. Don't overthink it. Come on, just you've got to do the exchange. You could you could have done a five for a five, but that would have been a good one. Okay, are we all are we all doing we all done? How are we getting on? Just put your hand up when you finished. On for your table, hands up when you finished. Still. Still doing it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Right. We sh we should be all the way round now. Now, what's what's interesting is, um, do you notice like how any of you notice kind of how you're feeling as you're kind of like handing the going through the transaction? You're trying to work out whether you're getting good value for money or not out of that exchange. Okay. Some some of you are now like up an iPhone for a fiver. That's a good deal. By the way, you get to keep the things you just bought. Um, 
There we go. You've got a car. Amazing. <laughs> oh, no. Buyer's remorse. So, but notice, notice that you, you'll, you'll understand the feeling bit a bit better in a second, okay? But um, uh, interestingly, you notice you had one five pound note per table. It went round the table. It created about 50 pounds worth or 80, 40 pounds or 50 pounds worth of value as it went round the table. That's one five pound note. So just a little thing to remember. Money doesn't make the world go around. Money goes around the world. It's about how you, you've got to be there to, to take the money at the right appropriate time. Also, if you're creating and adding value to the world, you're going to get more money. Okay. But now, I'm going to do something slightly different. Okay. We're going to do the same exercise, but who am I going to pick on? So you guys have done this before. You've done it before. I'm going to go to this table. <laughs> this table. And... Hmm. Are we giving you one? Go to this table. Now, straight away, straight away, I know that some of you are thinking, oh, he hasn't given us a fucking 50 pound note. <laughs> okay? So, uh, hold, hold that thought. That's okay. Okay? But I want the guys who've got the 50 pound note and girls who've got the 50 pound note just to quickly whiz around and do the same, same exercise. Okay? I want the other tables to observe them. <laughs> Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it because we're, we're kind of running out of time. So I need you to kind of go around fairly quickly. Interestingly, interestingly, this chap didn't want to let go of his £50 note. I did, I did this exercise last week and one person didn't even pick it up. She left it on the table, wouldn't touch it. Isn't that fascinating? Okay? Keep going, keep going. Go all the way around the table. Somebody's pocketed the 50. <laughs> yeah, what 50? Lady Oh, yes. Yeah. Cool. Have you been all the way around, V? Gosh, that was quick. Are we still going, are we? Yeah. I'm just bartering on where, where I'm going to go. Every, have you been around, though, everybody yet? No. <laughs> have you have you been all the way round? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. You don't get to it. <laughs> come on, come on, go, go, go. No, I like that. That's that's clever. Yeah, some serious wheeler dealing going on. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Now, interesting question which I've got for you now. So, any any kind of observers? Did you make any interesting observations as that was going around? Can I borrow your five? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Input, yeah. Yeah. Um, guys who are actually doing that exercise with the 50, did you feel different? Positive? Negative? Positive. So we all felt better. Now, bearing in mind these are, I mean, this isn't paper anymore, but two bits of paper with the Queen's head on it and some numbers, okay? Fundamentally, what you've just experienced there, the feeling is ha your, your attachment to these funny bits of paper here, okay? So the fact that you felt better because of that. Now, why did you feel better? It's because it's mine, yeah. <laughs> so um, it's because it's a higher denomination. We're, we're, de we're not as desensitized. Like, we're desensitized to these because they're everywhere, whereas we don't often see these, like, in circulation every day. Um, but, but also we place a, a higher, like, emotional 
value on that as well, like as we're going around doing that value exchange. Some of those exchanges, may, you may have got better value for money out of your five than necessarily out of your 50. So it's kind of making sense. Um, but what's interesting, though, is that you, you all felt more positive about this one, right? So think about this. Do you also feel more positive when you go out and spend a bit more money on something and treat yourselves? Do you feel good? Okay. So why, why don't we treat our businesses like that? Right? When you, when you go out and if you had a £20 pair of jeans from Primark or a £200 pair of Levi's, which ones are you going to do the gardening in? Which ones are you going to do, like, go, go out in and probably wear three times? Yeah? You're going you're gonna to treasure the £200 jeans more than you will do the £20. You're going to do your gardening in, like, the £20 pair of jeans. This is kind of making sense, okay? So actually, when we, when we um, spend more on something, we feel better about it. We look after it better. We invest more time and energy into it. Okay. So when you sell your products and services and you double your prices, the person who is receiving your product or service is going to feel better when they buy it from you. This is really, really important. It's subtle, but really, really important. Okay. Now, like I said, it's not just a process of like doubling your prices and hey presto, like magically we've solved the world's problems, all right? There's a process. Okay, the first one, which I've done a little bit of there, is just the mindset, the emotional attachment to the money. Okay. So you've got to first of all, you've got to have this idea seeded that you're gonna put your prices up. You've got to sow the seed, you've got to start playing with it, tinker with it, and eventually you're gonna take that leap of faith. So I know what I'm fucking talking about, right? And you're gonna put your prices up. Okay. The second thing is then, you're going to have to wait until you validate at the new price point. You're not going to wait for the first client to come along and say, oh, it's too expensive, and like make your decision based on that one person. Okay. You're going to go out there and pitch your product at double the price to enough people so you can get enough data to validate whether it's going to work or not. And finally, that takes time and persistence. Is everybody aware at like Braveheart, where Mel Gibson's there going, hold, like waiting for that opportune moment? to go into battle, it's a little bit like that. You've just got to stand your ground and go, no, no, I'm just going to stick to this price. I'm going to, I'm going to stand firm there. And, and, you know, but also, remember what I said right at the start about David Beckham practicing every day? We don't just wait until the end of the year to put our prices up. There is a way that you can, a process where you can kind of um, change, evolve your products to take them out to the marketplace so they're now new and start pitching your product at a different price point. And start validating it. And it doesn't just have to be, right, I'm going to get like put it out at this price and then that is it. It could be that you sell it at 500 quid, you test it at 900, you test it at 1500, you test it at 1800. Hey, presto, 2.5K. Yeah. I, yeah, there's a, there's a nice, I get real commitment from my clients. And, um, you know, I get more time to deliver a best quality product. Okay? But the one thing that is going to stop you from doing that is fear. I can guarantee, right? That piece of paper, which I told you to write down the number, okay? I want you to just go back now and write down, ask, I'll ask the same question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to go out after today and double your prices? Write a number down. Hands up if it's higher than the start of my talk. Good, good. I've made an impact. Bloody hell. Okay? But the one thing, so some of you who didn't put your hand up, the fear is there, okay? Probably why you need to speak to like Adam and myself. Kind of start looking at your product, start looking at your pricing. Okay, start <laughs> dissecting your value proposition, start understanding it a bit better. But as Seneca once said, we suffer more in imagination than reality. How many times have you sat there and procrastinated and not done anything, and then finally you've done it and you go, oh, it wasn't that bad. Okay, <laughs> it's the same process with pricing. So there you go, fearless business. <laughs>